Huddle with Corporate Cars, delivering affordable, luxury European vehicles nationwide. It is now 20 to 6. Josie Pagani is with us. Hello, Josie. Hi, Larry. Cameron Slater not quite set for a start, Josie. So, yes, he is. Here he is. Just hold on. And Cameron Slater from Whale Oil has turned up. Hello, Cam. Hey, Larry. How are you? Josie, Malaysia Airlines MH370 going missing, crashed, a plane broke up, terrorism attack. We just don't know, and it's all a mystery. What's your, a mystery. What's your take on this? Well, that's the thing. I, no one seems to have any new information, so we're all just grasping at straws, literally. And the, the biggest uh, um, straw that we've got to, to grasp is, is these uh, supposedly four false passports, at least two we know for certain. And it does seem extraordinary, doesn't it? I know you've been saying this, but the, the fact that we go through all this airline security, you take your shoes off, you get your nail scissors confiscated, constantly upending your makeup bag, um, and yet you can get on a plane with a false passport that's not reference checked with Interpol's list of, uh, what was it, a billion passports last year, I think, Larry, that, that were um, on Interpol's list. No, no, it was about 39 million, so around 40 million, uh, Cameron. I think that right. seems to be uh, a very concerning issue, and from what we can make out, immigration here is not connected to that database. I mean, they haven't told us they, they're they connected, uh, so what do you make of it all? Well, just this. The, the thing with the air, aircraft, these triple sevens have been around for a long time. I think this actual airframe is about 11 years old in this case. Is not likely to have a catastrophic error at, at two hours into a flight. That's cruise time. Even if engines fail, uh, you've got time to to make calls and do those sorts of those things before the plane falls into the water. So it suggests that it's some sort of massive catastrophic failure that didn't allow the crew to, to make calls. Uh, that then, coupled with the with the you know, false passports, starts thinking like it's some sort of calculated terror act or some or, or something like that. But yeah. again, no one's claimed any responsibility. Right. Terrorists thing, usually like to skite about these things. Yes, if it was a terrorist attack, you want. You want the links to be found. Um, so yeah. the other option, I suppose, uh, that, that is that it's, it's it's illegal immigrants who are using these stolen passports, trying to. And I mean, Southeast Asia is known to be mm. the biggest booming market for stolen. They passports. don't seem to blow up planes with themselves on it, though. No, there um, is one president cam of. Uh, I think it was in 2009, the Air New Zealand flight that that crashed tragically, and and many people were killed. Then that that was mechanical failure, and that was. A, yes, um, I know, but it was also on approach to landing. And those that, no, that's when these mode. catastrophic things happen in approaches to landing. While no, Cam, it was in. Uh, it was at, it, what, what's so interesting about it was that it was in cro- in cruise mode, which is, as you say, very unlikely. And also, yes. what happened was that it took months and months to find the debris, uh, and I think a year before they found the the, the black box or the data. One on thing the people haven't been uh, asking about is whether or not it's a missile strike. And, yeah. uh, of course, they're flying over a hotly contested uh, South China Sea and, uh, you know, the area that's in dispute with China and Vietnam and Indonesia and the Philippines all disputing that particular area. Uh, it is possible... Well, that actually, could... it's interesting you should say that because I think it was in the 1980s, wasn't it, where the U.S. Uh, accidentally shot down an Iran air flight and again 290 people were killed and well, the Russians accident. of course shot down the Korean air flight as well yes Yes, so that has happened these things have happened but the weather was good so it's not the weather that was apparently blue skies um, it seems unlikely it's a mechanical failure, but we just don't mm. know. All right, we'll come back in a moment. Joseph Pagani, Cameron Slater with me. News, news Talks at B, it is now 16 to 6. It's election year, and it's Larry Williams Drive with ANZ, the bank with more local experts on News Talk ZB. Cameron Slater and Joseph Pagani on the huddle. Cameron, issue number two, election date is... September 20, uh, earlier rather than later, for obvious reasons. What do you see? Well, I think uh, John Key's been quite cunning about this. He's uh, he's picked a date that allows a government to be formed uh, in time for the G20, or G21, as people are liking to call it. But more importantly, and the key date here, is uh, Parliament rises on July 31st. Now, what that signals is that National is planning on running basically a long campaign. It's not going to be a six-week or a four-week campaign. It's going to run from July 31, 
right through to September 20. And I think that they will uh, basically grind down and wear down the Labour Party over that time um, just, just because they can. I think it makes sense to... I like this, this um, uh, tradition of letting people know early, as early as possible, and it makes sense from National's point of view, to call the election this week. It's been a, been a bad week for Labour. Uh, and September the 20th, again, uh, you know, I agree that September... He, it, John Key today talked about a September to September cycle, which does actually make sense, as Cam said. So um, I think, look, it's better that we all know, we can all plan, we can you know, mm. plan our holidays <laughs> to go away after the Blimmin election Okay, um, and get through it. Cam- Cameron, the other thing is state funding of political parties seems to have reared its head again. Labor seems to be angling for this. What do you see in this? Uh, well, they, have seen, they have seen, because when my father was the president, he used to constantly battle off with the uh, president of the Labor Party who tried to always do cosy deals with National, get the two biggest parties to agree to state funding of political parties. It's always been Labor's dream to have such a thing. And uh, and I think that they've been milking this donations and, you know, uh, alleged scandals of drinking milk and all of that. It's, it's designed purely for them to continue that narrative that we should have state funding of political parties. And all that does is protect incumbency and it rewards the existing parties that are in Parliament. It's bad enough we're funding their uh, media uh, budgets for elections. Uh, I just think it needs to be opposed at every step. I actually think we've got, we've got the right balance as it exists now. We've mm. got a mix in New Zealand. So, so the taxpayer funds political parties in Parliament funds their research, you know, they can phone the parliamentary library, funds their activities to go and talk to journalists or go out and meet people and front the public. That's all, I think that's all very healthy in a democracy and funding broadcasting too. But it expects parties to go out and win support the hard way and raise your own money. So I think it's a good mix and I don't think we should go about changing it. Oh, that's interesting because I don't, I don't, I just don't think uh, taxpayers should be paying for political parties. I just don't think it's on. Although they don't it, want well, my tax dollars came no. to the Green Party. That's yeah, but sure. part, part of, I mean, I think, I just think you get a balance where, where um, you know, you're right, you have to go out and actually win support. So you have to go out and, and this has all come about because of the Antoine dinner fundraising that John Key had and people paid $5,000 which and Labor does the same sort of thing. That's right. They, they have, um, you know, fundraising. Parties have to do it the hard way, and that's good. But, but if you if you're funding think really important stuff like um, the ability for political parties to do research in Parliament or to pay for airfares to go in front public and actually, you know, go eyeball to eyeball with the public, yes. I think that's healthy in a democracy. Otherwise, they'll end up staying outrageous. in Parliament. I think what is outrageous, though, Josie, is that the only parties that are allowed to have any allocation from, from for broadcasting are essentially existing parties, and there's no ability for a new party. And Kim.com is going to find this out very quickly. There's no uh, there's no ability for a new party to purchase broadcasting time on television or on radio. Yeah, but That's Kim.com. Tightly controlled. Kim.com has paid for his own adverts. I mean, we've all seen the back of the bus and, and TV yep. stuff. So, you know, if you can go out and raise the money, then go for it. <laughs> but, you know, otherwise, uh, the taxpayer okay. will pay for, for election um, advertising. Well, I don't believe we good. should. You should be able to buy whatever ads you want. But then you get people like .com dominating the advertising cycle. Yeah, but if they've got some that. ideas, it doesn't matter. Because well, some money. ideas are dumb ideas, no matter how good your advertising is. But if you've got money, it doesn't matter how good your ideas are, you'll be on air all the time. So I think well, this is a fair balance. I think we've got it right. I think, you know, it's balance is there and it's, it's um, worth protecting. Thank you, Josie, and thank you, Cameron. That is Cameron Slater and Josie Pagani on the huddle. We have some sport in just a moment. It's now 9 to 6.